My name is James Ford, and I'm the consulting minister. I have the enormous pleasure of being the consulting minister for the Unitarian Universalist Church in Anaheim. It's a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association. And a special shout out to the members of the uh, Empty Moon Zen Sangha who are joining us via the Facebook live stream. Here's the question. Are all religions one? Are all those paths winding up the same mountain? For me, this is more than an abstract question. The greater part of my life has been dedicated to the spiritual quest. For me, sorting through the many different possibilities, separating any possible dross from any potential gold has been and remains enormously important to me. And one other thing, I came of age in the late 1960s in the San Francisco Bay Area. You put these two things together, my lifelong commitment to the great spiritual questions and where and when I came of age, and you know I have a lot of sorting to do. In my late adolescence, when I began, and in my early adulthood, as I embarked deeply into my investigations, I encountered, well, let's call it an astonishing spiritual marketplace. It was a grand bazaar of religious possibility. This was something possibly unparalleled in human history. I would say some medieval ports of call along the Silk Road Maybe, but even those not near the scale, not with the astonishing range on offer as that magical time and place of my youth and young adulthood. For me, having lost my childhood faith, a poor people's version of fundamentalist Christianity, interestingly, a version of that tradition near as I can tell now, really only alive in the black church, I tasted many of the offerings at that astonishing spiritual smorgasbord. I heard Stephen Gaskin explain the spirituality of psychedelics at his Monday night class. I heard Yogi Bhajan explain the powers of Kundalini. I heard Swamis at the Vedanta Society elaborate on their teaching that all religions are indeed one. I heard Tarthang Tulku explain the use of a prayer wheel, and I swear I remember, although I've been told it is in fact unlikely, I heard Chogyam Trungpa elaborate on the intricacies of Vajrayana Buddhism while sitting on a stage drinking one beer after another. The list goes on. At some point, I learned how to meditate in the Zen tradition, both from students of the Japanese missionary Shunryu Suzuki. Gradually, I found that practice becoming the touchstone of my life. I would eventually fall in with a Zen teacher who was both powerful and more than a little cult-like. I became a Zen monk. I was a Zen priest. There was some Further searching, I danced with Sufis and attended first a liberal Catholic, that's a small Western Gnostic church, and then an Episcopal church, each for a while. Then finally, I settled onto the path that has nourished and formed me for, well, now pushing on 40 years. My life is a blending of regular Zen practice rooted in the disciplines of presence further informed by decades of koan introspection, grounded in numerous retreats, and at the same time, seriously living into the Unitarian Universalist Church. I was ordained a UU minister and served parish ministry for more than a quarter of a century. Me. And of course, if you're discerning in these matters, you might pick up some assumptions I might have. Now, an article of faith in my youthful searching was that all religions were in some essential way one. 
I'd read Aldous Huxley's perennial philosophy early on, and about the same time, Houston Smith's Religions of Man. In 1991, it would be expanded and retitled The World's Religions. These books, and a host of similar titles, I think of the entirety of Alan Watts' writings, captured the zeitgeist of that era, all of them assuming a current of wisdom running through all the world's religions. For me personally, after Christianity and before Buddhism, I was most interested in Vedanta, and they're very much about all religions are one. Finding one's religious community and spiritual guides was more about finding a right fit than a one true way. Maybe I came to feel at some point each of us does need to find an only true way. That is, you have to find a better chance of finding water with a single deep well than with many shallow ones. But that didn't mean any of the other ways were somehow less, certainly not flat out wrong. But is that true? In 2010, Professor Stephen Prothero, uh, a professor of religion at Boston University, hit the bestseller list with a book titled, God is Not One. The subtitle digs a bit further into that, the eight rival religions that run through the world and why their differences matter. He contends how the Age of Enlightenment in the 18th century popularized the idea of religious tolerance, and we are doubtless better for that. But the idea of religious unity, he says, is wishful thinking. Actually, he goes beyond condemning the unity of religions as mere fantasy. He asserts it is a willful ignorance that makes the world a more dangerous place. And perhaps he's right. It is important to know your neighbor and to have an honest insight into the religions of the world probably is a very good idea in an era like ours where the clash of civilization seems to have shifted from capitalism and communism to Christianity and Islam. Okay, perhaps an overreach, but not by much. Today, many of the world's conflicts have religious overtones. Christianity and Islam principle among these. As Muslims count for slightly less than a quarter of the world's population, and Christians for slightly more than a quarter. If you're a liberal arts major, that means half the world. Their conflicts become everyone's. On smaller scales, we can see the pattern repeat. Hindu and Muslim, Muslim and Buddhist, Buddhist and Hindu are examples that easily come to mind. Tensions and outright conflict. People die. All right, with that, my provisional answer to the question about the unity of religions. In life, there are very few things where we can get anything that is absolutely so. Provisional, subject to new information. All that said, the answer to the question, are the world's religions really one, is probably no. And yet, there is something which calls, calls for hedging, hesitation, openness. Is there any place for that idea that there is a current or currents that extend across religions? That seems to be a yes. There is the obvious ethical connection among the religions. It's hard to have missed one of those lists of the golden rule and how that rule is articulated within pretty much all religions. They all believe in equity and treating your neighbor fairly. It may feature more strongly with one tradition than another, but it's there. In fact, it's probably the deeper connection driving much of today's interfaith dialogue, reminding us of our particular religion's rule to not harm others. The idea is to feel a little closer, to at least see each other's humanity. 
and from that to be a little bit less dangerous to each other. But something more, something about ultimacy and meaning. I find it interesting that Professor Prothero actually does see one thing that all the world's religions, at least the ones he has studied, have in common. He observes, and I quote, what the world's religions share is not so much a finishing line as a starting point. And where they begin is with this simple observation. Something is wrong with the world. Now, the good professor goes on to list what he acknowledges as an oversimplistic schema of how religions see that wrong and that solution. For Judaism, the problem is exile, while the solution is returning home. For Christians, the problem is sin, and the solution is salvation. For Islam, the problem is pride, the solution submission. For Confucianism, the problem is chaos, and the solution is social order. Professor Prothero seems to enjoy juxtapositioning this with the other Chinese religion, Taoism, which has lifelessness as the problem and flourishing or spontaneity as the solution. Clearly, religions mirroring each other, not all not all that unlike the Chinese symbol of the Tai Chi, the grand ultimate. Two tadpoles, one black with a white eye and the other white with a black eye joined in a circle. And his summaries for Hinduism um, with the problem being samsara or delusion and the solution moksha or liberation and Buddhism's problem of suffering and solution of enlightenment or awakening if not further on packed, certainly look to be much the same thing. Actually, I recall how much I really, really liked God is not one. In some ways, it's a welcome corrective to Houston Smith's aging classic, The World's Religions. It paints respectful pictures of the uniqueness of each of the traditions he addresses. His clarity of lines between the religions is important, but there is an enormous lacuna to the text. Lacuna is a delicious term. Uh, it's a $2 word meaning gap. Respect, however, calls for lacuna. Mysticism is mentioned only six times in this 388 page book. Non-duality isn't mentioned once. And I suspect if we're looking for any genuine overarching connection, binding the world's traditions together, instead of merely some aspect of each of the world's cultures, largely unique to its own place in history, I strongly believe it will be found within the mystical traditions of those many religions, so different in so many ways. Of course, a world of caution, Gilbert Chesterton once quipped how mysticism starts in mist and ends in schism with an I in the middle. Mysticism is itself a bit of a garbage word containing too many definitions. A magician bending spoons is a mystic. A fortune teller peering into a crystal ball is a mystic. And are certain saints and ecstatics in every religion. It is those saints and ecstatics in every religion that I find compelling. You know, once you can assert every religion, then there is probably something that needs attention. So, so far here in this meditation, I've only noted two things that fit that bill. One is the golden rule, the other is that every religion notices there is something wrong in or with the world. If we look at Professor Prothero's list, we see certain resonances as they attempt to identify that wrong. Chaos, social disorder, lifelessness, more ambiguous terms like sin and suffering. They're not so contradictory. Each can be seen as an angle on some ancient sense of dissatisfaction. 
and thin. Within all this, at some point in most, maybe all religions, there is a call to some mysterious intimacy that cures the hurt, that cures the hurt. Sometimes a distinction is drawn between the exoteric, uh, the plain statements of the religion, and the esoteric, the hidden jewel of the religion. Here I feel we're approaching something worthy, although we should be hesitant, cautious. What might be the jewel nonetheless? What might be the pearl of great price? Some speak of a drawing near. Others say it is becoming one. And still others speak of stepping beyond one and two. Some call it God. And others appeal to a collapsing or burning away of any words and a call to us simply to some grave, powerful, compelling silence. Each of these ways is at the very least clothed in the tradition from which in which they exist. And I suspect there's more to this than a flavor. The universal appears only ever to manifest in the particular. And there's something to that. What precisely, I can't say. We each are the products of our time and place. Although here there is a hint to something more, or at least to something richer. I personally experienced profound connections to my childhood Christianity. The wealth of the stories, the images of that burning bush, and that voice out of the whirlwind that is also a still small voice, and Jesus holding up a bit of bread and declaring it is his body. And in my adolescent and in my adult years, I cannot say how deeply moved I am by the story of Exodus, of exile and returning. Even knowing probably not a word of Egypt is true, not in the historical sense. It is almost certainly a projection back from a different captivity, that one by the waters of Babylon. I think of those relentless cries of the prophets to stand with the poor and to bend, blend justice and mercy. These are parts of me, all of them. I am a part of them, all of them. So how can I deny Christianity? How can I deny Judaism? And I am also heir to the naturalist theologies of liberal religion. This is a Unitarian Universalist congregation and I belong here. I believe reason is a great gift. If anything is the image of God, it is reason. I think of the constantly renewed epic of the cosmos, of the Big Bang and the great arc of evolution, and the miracle that we human beings can witness. I consider all this and my heart leaps in response like a flock of ducks rising in the morning mist. And, and the wisdom of the Zen way informs everything I think and do. It is the discipline of my heart and has been a touchstone of my walking in this world for 50 and more years. My understanding of the world is found in Zen's great leap beyond attachment to the phenomenal world or to an emptiness inherent within all things, neither one nor two. Zen's allowing the 10,000 things to pass through my senses to my heart, showing me the ordinariness is the sacred and the sacred is the ordinary. And most of all, reminding me that there is no other place. And what is revealed in this place? Chaos, hurt, longing, the agony of passingness, and love, love, an embrace, an intimacy, totally beyond any common sense, 
rising and dancing and calling us together to connections, to intimacies so close that words, any words, fail. I find myself called back to my grand teacher on the Zen way, Robert Aitken, poet, social justice activist, and Zen master. I have heard it said, wrote the old teacher in the morning star, which I think might have been his last book, that all paths lead to the top of the same mountain. He writes, I doubt it. I think, says Robert Aitken, that one mountain may seem a small hill from the top of another. Let 100 mountains rise. Meanwhile, you must find your own path and your own mountain. Mountains, mist, and each of us called to take our own step. And yet, somehow we do do it together. The sun and the moon and the stars, you and me. So, are all religions one? No not by most conventional standards of judgment. And yet, there's something calling, and the world's spiritual traditions do appear to approach it, each in their own way, filled with contradiction, ugliness, and beauty. As the great Japanese poet Kobayashi Issa sang on the death of his daughter, this world of do is a world of do. And yet, and yet. The religions of this world are not one. And yet, and yet. Thank you so much.